You know, it's interesting. I, I think it's, there's a lot of people kind of grieving about what happened. And, and I, but I feel like, you know, in the spirit realm, we've, we've kind of crossed the marker, you know. And I feel like on a positive note that God's about to do something significant in our nation. I believe we're, we're, we're living in the timing of God in this season. And, and you know, it's, it's very easy to look at this stuff and say, well, you know, this is just so bad, this is so negative. But, but you know, God doesn't measure like we measure. Who knows that? Who understands that? I believe that some of these things have been prophesied even in Scripture. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, men will be lovers of themselves. Mm. Lovers of Lovers of evil, haters, haters of good, lovers of evil. And, you know, I believe that as, as we're living in a time that's prophesied by the Word of God, that is starting to come to pass. I, I, I feel it's so interesting that um, this week I heard some politicians saying, uh, this is a victory for love. You know, I'm a child of the 60s and that was a cry from that generation as well. If you remember, free love, make war, make, make love, not war. Remember that one? Yeah. How did that go? <laughs> that really figured out well, didn't it? Peace and love. I remember that. The fruit of it was just kind of more depravity. You know, Jesus said, when he comes back, it will be like the days of Noah. Let's read out of Matthew chapter 24. I'm not going to speak too long out of this, but I just think it's important we get a grasp of the times in which we live. Matthew 24, verse, verse 36, it says, But of that day and the hour no one knows, for even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as the day, days before the flood, though eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. You know, we're living in times that are going to get darker. There's no doubt about that. We need to understand that this has been prophesied by the word of, word of the Lord. I believe, and we've been preaching, that we can redeem culture. I absolutely believe that. I believe that we, the church, can affect the culture around about us. But we need to recognize that the, the Bible prophesies that in the, as the days go on, things will become more and more significantly worse. But it's part of the time when we can stand up, because the Bible says, stand up for your redemption is nigh. The dark and the light rising together. You know, friends, where we reap, we will sow. If we sow to the flesh, from the flesh we reap a harvest. Those you know, I've, I've read this week a few Christians around the world saying, you know, the, the Lord's about to judge Australia. And can I say that um, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that because that's not the way God is. He doesn't judge us for decisions that are made. You know, I believe sometimes there's a misunderstanding on the nature of God. He's a God of love. He's a God of kindness. The Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Yes. And those that say, you know, God is going to judge us for this, don't understand that he is a, he's a loving, kind God. Yes, we reap where we sow. Yes, things will get darker, but it's not God's doing, it's ours. Yes. We will reap the things that we do. Friends, the darkness that we're in is not God's fault. It's ours. And we, the Christians, we, the Bible said, are called to be light and salt in the midst of a darkening world. This is the promise of Scripture. Will this stuff affect us as, as gay marriage is introduced? Absolutely it will affect us. But this is not the judgment. It's simply fruit of the choices we make. And I believe as darkness will, will increase, so increases the brightness of the Lord. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard. And I believe the day in which we live is a time where the Lord says, you know, I'm going to stand in the midst of all the darkness and declare my light. And my, my children will run to the light. You know, friends, what a promise from God that is. You know, this week, um, I've been sharing over the last few weeks that I really believe that 
We're called to stand in the gap as a church. The Bible is called for people. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, I look for a man among them that would stand in the gap, gap and yet I found no one. And I believe so strongly that the Lord has called us as a church to intercede for our city, intercede even for our nation. And you know, I believe there's a call upon us at this time to really stand in that place. And I feel like God has just shared with me some things about that. I feel like, you know, we've, we've obtained a place in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I'm going to let that sink in. I believe we've obtained a place in God. I believe the Lord is hearing our prayers. In 2 Chronicles 5, you know, 4, 7 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Yeah. And then verse 15 says, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is offered in this place. And I believe, friends, that that's a promise to us. My eyes are open and my ears are attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place. I feel like the Lord is saying to us as a people right now, I'm attentive to your prayers. I'm listening to the cry of your heart. I'm about to act on what you're asking me. I feel like we've obtained. And the Lord is standing with us at this time. You know, there's been such a, a strong sense of intercession that's come upon us as a church. And I believe that the cry, the cry of God for us to this, for this fellowship is that we would stand on behalf of the nation. That we would stand on behalf of the city. That we would stand on behalf of what he is about to do. You know, the Bible says the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too, too deep for words. I personally have been challenged as I've been spending so much, you know, my time just praying. And I just feel so strongly the, the presence of God, the favor of God as, we, as we're pressing through, as we're grabbing a hold of the hem of his car and saying, Daddy, Father, come on. Come on, I just feel like the Lord is saying, you know, friends, I've, you've obtained, you've got my ear, you've got my heart in this. I want you to pray. I want you to touch heaven. You know, there's a promise in the, in the Old Testament to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, chapter 12 verse 3. And it was repeated again in the New Testament. It says, those that have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The insight of heaven. Who would like the insight of heaven? I would. I would like the insight of heaven. And friends, I want to encourage you. I believe the word of the Lord to us today is I'm about to release the insight from heaven to you. I'm going to give you the ability to understand my ways. You know, the Lord took me this week to a scripture, and I want you to read it with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is really what I wanted to share. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And it says, Rather, it is written, No eye has seen. No ear has heard, no heart has imagined what God has prepared for those that love Him. But the God has revealed it to us by the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except his own spirit within him? So too no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, the deep things of God. Friends, I believe that God is wanting to give us the deep things of God. What does that mean? He's looking for people that will really know Him, that will really understand Him, that will really grasp how wide and how deep and how high is His love, 
A people that will be so driven by His presence, so desiring, oh Lord, just take a hold of my life. To understand. You know, it's, have you ever been in a relationship with someone and after a while, at first you think, well, I get to know them. And, but after a while, you've been with them. And then you realize, you know, there's a whole side to them that I never saw before. Who's ever experienced that? You know, you get married to someone and you thought you knew them. Then you live with them. And then you think, man, what the heck am I married? <laughs> 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 No, I'm not talking about anyone, I'm just saying. You know. what, what's going on? And we don't know someone, there's an old saying, we don't know someone until you live with them. Who's heard that saying before? And I want to say to you, you know, we don't even understand God. We don't even understand His nature. And I believe in this generation, He's about to reveal the deep things of God. He's about to unfold to us a revelation of who He is. What he is, what he cares about, what he desires. And Lord, he's looking for a people that just want to draw near yeah. and say, Father, share with me the yeah. deep secrets. And I want to say to you this morning, God is wanting to reveal his nature to his church, how generous he is. What he, what he longs to do in this generation. And I've said this before, but he will not share his secrets with casual observers. He's looking for those that will seek him with all of their heart. Seek him with all of their soul. You know, those who discipline their lives. You know that word discipline, we don't use it too much today, but the word disciple, and Jesus said, go and make disciples of all men, is taken from an English word called discipline. And to be a disciple means we've got to discipline ourselves. Who likes discipline? If you put your hand up, I'd ask you to come up and get prayer. <laughs> No one likes discipline. In fact, the scriptures tell us that no one likes discipline. But you like what it does in you. It develops character. Yeah. And I want to say to you, God is looking for a people of character in this hour. He's looking for people that are, able to tr that are trustworthy with the message of grace. You know, there's a cost to serving God. Amen. Who's ever heard the message, come to Jesus and everything will be great? <laughs> Come to Jesus and everything will start to go bad for a while. Then it will get worse. But he'll be with you in the trouble. He'll be with you in the dark times. Come to Jesus and all the stuff will start to go wrong. But he'll be with you in the midst of it. And he'll make you more than a conqueror. Jesus doesn't want to take away your troubles. He wants to cause you to start to stand on top of them and be more than a conqueror in heaven. That's the promise of Scripture. That's what being a Christian is. And that, friends, is what discipline about discipling is all about. James chapter 4 tells us, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you your sins, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So how can we position ourselves I, you know, one of the things that I've been really wrestling with this, this week, you know, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but we stand against principalities and power. But I want to say to you, there is a wrestling that takes place as we press into God. And it's a wrestling with our flesh. It's a wrestling with who gets to lead this thing. What decision will I make? A wrestling for who's in charge. And I was reminded this week some of these promises out of the Word of God, things that I haven't thought about for a long time. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, You were dead in your, trans your trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the Son's of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air. 
You know, we live in a generation that is so connected. We all have a mobile phone, we all spend our day doing that. Have you ever gone to an airport recently? People don't look at you anymore. They're all doing this. Every one of them. Doesn't matter what nation they're from, they're all doing this. Doing this. All this. <laughs> but seriously, it's quite amusing if you sit there and you realise, man, the entire place is doing this or doing this. That's what's going on. It's, that's society today, you know, that's a generational thing. I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have a computer. Who remembers that? Yeah. Most of you are here. <laughs> we haven't got all the young people. But we've technologically, you know, Australians are fast adopters. Did you know that? We actually adopt technology quicker than any other nation. It comes back to our pioneering spirit. We're happy to, you know, a new thing comes along and we want to ditch the old one and get a new thing. Who knows that? Who wants a new iPhone X? Really? No. I've got a couple of year old iPhone, it's still doing okay, you know. I get all these apps, you know. I've got so many apps I don't know what the heck to do with them. I don't even know half of them do. I just flip through, you know. Because I'm not really that technologically, you know, savvy. But you know what I want to say to you, the scriptures say here that he is the prince of the power of the air. You ever figured where all this stuff travels? And I believe that we're living in a generation that we're going to see some stuff take place technologically that are going to challenge stuff that we are and stuff that we believe as people. The greatest power the enemy has when he comes when we don't see him. You know, when things go wrong, God, it's the devil. He's just attacking. But when things are right, we think, no, it's good. In blessing, we rarely challenge things. But the whole deal with the devil is the Bible said he's the father of lies. Deception's his thing. That's what he does. And I believe, friends, that we're living in a time where we're going to see deception rise in the world in ways that will deceive us more than you realize. Who's ever seen a magician work? Somebody who's a who's a, what do you call it, a sleight of hand guy. Yeah. Amazing. Illusions. Illusions, that's the word. And the whole deal is it's an illusion. I'll do something and I would like to demonstrate, but I'm completely hopeless at this sort of thing, but, you know, I'll just make something appear out of nowhere. But it was an illusion. It didn't really appear out of nowhere at all. Really, this man had practiced and practiced and practiced till it seemed like it just came from nowhere. He, he performed an illusion, a d delusion on you. And a lot of what the enemy will do in these last days is try and delude. That's right. the, the, you know, the Bible actually says he will even deceive the elect if that were, that were possible. The elect. How? Well, I believe he's going to use technology. You know, the second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 says, Satan disguises himself as an angel of life. You know, when I was first saved, I remember, I came out of the, like the world, you know, and I remember the church we were in, it was all about, you know, you've got to get rid of your old world. And I remember we brought all my albums, all my records. Remember, the round black things. <laughs> I hope we don't use them anymore. And I brought them all, and I burnt them. You might think that's a bit radical, but for me, it was actually getting rid of my old life. It was actually me saying, putting a line in the sand and saying, I am a new creature in Christ. I'm not driven by that anymore. Now, you might think, well, I'm burning there worth money. <laughs> well, it's a bit late for me. <laughs> I remember, you know, we, we used to do this sort of stuff. We had this young guy living with me who, who'd been into witchcraft and we used to, we, we burned all this stuff one day. It was in the, incin the incinerator at the back of the church down at Richmond. And we threw all this stuff, all this witchcraft stuff in this incinerator. And as it burnt, the flames, these demonic things were dancing in the flames. Seriously, it was bizarre as we watched that happen. But we were breaking some curses over this young, young fellow's life. 
Anyway, back to what I was sharing. I, you know, I feel like we're living in a generation that's a lot more relaxed about this stuff, you know? Well, you know, God wouldn't have me to do that. I, I, can, just, I can just do whatever it is. I don't need to worry too much about my past. You know, the Bible says, um, t tells us, you know, that we are affected. The book, let, let me read a scripture to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. You know, friends, we're living in a day that I believe that We've got to watch what we allow in our hearts. What we watch, what we allow into our lives. Watch things that are not beneficial, not helpful, because they come from the spirit of this world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, Do not be misled, but bad company corrupts good character. And I remember, you know, I got saved, and, and these scriptures were so important in my heart because as I read them, they were like the guiding light for me to say, Well, you know, I've got to separate myself, myself from my, my old life. Remember, <laughs> all my friends, they stayed in intervention one day. I'd gotten saved, you know, and I was still hanging around my old friends. And, and this morning we'd had a party and I, I'd spent the whole party preaching to everyone, you know, as you do. Yeah. I'd say that I did anyway. I, I got so, like, radically saved. I had this dirty rap big Bible and walk in the parties with the Bible and they go, oh, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this day, you know, after one of these days, all my friends, like, they, they were all kind of hung over, you know. And they decided to have this intervention. And they, they all just surrounded me and started having goes at me. It was just incredible. And the Lord gave me such a clarity of wisdom. And they go, they go, it's a crutch. And they're, it's a crutch. And I go, no, that's a crutch. That thing you have in your fingers. <laughs> that bottle you have, you know. And God just gave me such wisdom. And I was at peace as they tried to convince me that I'd been deceived by these religious fanatics. You know, I don't know why I'm saying this, but it was such a big deal for me. I've become so changed. I was such a new man. I remember my tongue was changed. I became born of the Spirit of God. Friends, as time increases, there's going to be a line between the children of light and the children of this age. In Titus chapter 2, verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright and godly life in this present age. 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober-minded, and your adversary the devil roams around like a roaring lion. It's like a hook. 
to get to your heart. It's so easy to get addicted to stuff like that. And I'm not saying don't do all that, it's, you know, this is the enemy. I'm saying to you, you need to guard your life. Yeah. I remember um, when our kids were little, we wouldn't allow a movie into our home that was above a PG rating. <laughs> it's nuts now. But that was a value we had. For 20 years, I didn't have a glass of alcohol. Not one single drop of alcohol passed my lips because I decided I'm going to serve Jesus. Now, I have a glass of wine today sometimes. I remember the day I had a glass of wine in front of my daughter, Jessica. She, she giggled. She was like an adult. You know, oh, that's great. You know, <laughs> to her, it was like, wow, wow, this is crazy. My father's doing this stuff. But for me, it was about, I grew up the son of an alcoholic. I watched my father drink his marriage to death. And I wanted to set an example for my family and say, you know, that's not who I am. I'm a son of the king. And that was a value that I held. That was something that was powerful for me. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Galatians 5 verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So friends, what is the Lord wanting us to do? You know, in Habakkuk, and this is kind of an obscure scripture, but I want to kind of finish with this. It says in Habakkuk chapter 2, I will take my post, I will position myself on the fortress, I'll keep watch what the Lord says to me and how he will respond to my complaint. I'll take my post. I'll set my place in God. And I believe the time has come for us to position ourselves, getting ready for what God is about to do. Position our hearts, position our families, position our finances, position what's going on around us, get us ready. I'll take my post. I'll position myself. You know, friends, we need to be in position for the Lord. And for me, and I believe for all of us here, it's the basics. It's the foundations. It's our prayer time. You know, we need to have a, a regular time with the Lord. This is stuff that you learn at the ABCs of the kingdom. Find a place that's his place and set it apart for him. That's discipline. It means maybe every night before you go to bed or maybe in the morning. In fact, the Bible tells us that in the morning is the place to seek God. I'm not much good in the morning, but who's the morning person? Okay, you should be seeking God in the morning. You need to find that place. Position yourself. Get ready. Find a place where you can spend time with Him. I like to walk, pray in tongues. And, and you know, lately I've, just, I've been finding this place where God just, he just says to me, Mark, just go and spend time with me. And I, was, I, I actually have this couch in my office at home now. And I've just been lying on it and just... Spending time in his prayer. I've been putting this music on and kind of living in and in this place. And I feel like the Lord is just in the room. He's saying, hey, I'm here. I'm hearing the prayers. I'm taking this as incense. I'm carrying this. And I feel the promises for all of us in the room. Find that place. Turn the box off and get out. Into that place with God. You know, not just an afterthought. You know, get into bread, bed just before you go to sleep. Oh, yeah, by the way, I'm going to take a shot of whatever. Who's ever done that? I have. But we need to set aside some time with God. Spend some time with Him. Be in His presence. Draw near to God, the Bible says, and He will draw near to you. Friends, don't neglect reading your word. Basics, yeah. But nothing changes. This Bible is our strength. The Bible tells us, Thy word, come on, Tony, have I hid in my heart? Can I remember it? Yes, that I might not sin against 
Your word, your word, have I hid it. This book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. This book is so imperative in the life of a believer. You think, well, I can serve God and, you know, I, I read my devotion. No, you need to be in the Word of God. Each day, set some time aside. Read the Word of God. Stay in your Word. You know, lately I've been um, reading through the book of Psalms and I've just been so enjoying that, you know. This, this book of Psalms is so full of this incredible language of worship, this incredible language of thanksgiving to God. And as you read it, it kind of lifts your spirit. And I've just been finding that it's such a powerful truth as I, as I meditate. As I think on these promises out of the book of Psalms, as thanksgiving, thank, thank offerings to God. You know, the, the other thing is I, I like to stay in the book of the Gospels. Yeah. The moment I'm reading the book of John, I'll finish John and go back to probably Matthew. And I'll just keep doing that. Every day I read a little bit of the Gospels. Keep the Word of God flowing in your life and God will use it. Friends, the Bible tells us about itself. The Word of God is quick and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And discerns the thoughts and intents of man's heart. Amen. That's good. Correctly, that's a good thing. Can you finish it? Amen. Let the word of God dwell in you. Friends, you know, I believe that the attack that's on us is an attack of compromise. Ah, I can watch this. It might be in rated and full of filthy language. You know, I my step to have Christians say, oh, yeah, it's really good. Don't, don't worry about the language, but it's bad. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, we also know I went and saw a movie recently, and I was horrified. By the end of it, I said to Samantha, she said the same thing to me. It was so full of filthy mouths. Every second thing, they were just swearing. I was thinking, no, I don't want to go and pay money and get sworn at for two hours. <laughs> I just, I just I found it so unpleasant. I don't know about you, you know, that's the way I used to speak. So I speak that way now, and I don't want to live in that place. I believe, friends, that God is wanting us to separate ourselves from some of that stuff. Be careful what you will allow to permeate. You know, in this world of, of free access to all the plug-in options on your TV, I've got a smart telly, you know, and you can watch anything. But is what you're watching going to be good for you? Is it going to build you up? Is it going to edify you? Another thing I feel like God wants us to remember is get a notebook. Get ready to write down what God says. I believe he's about to secrets to his beloved. You know, friends, there's a brooding on this place right now. Yeah. Trust me, revelation is coming. Breakthrough is in the wind. There's a cloud as big as a man's hand on the horizon. It may seem a way off, but it's coming. The river of God is going to flow. God's promises are yes and they are, are amen. God is not a man that he should lie. And I believe the promises of God will be fulfilled in this generation. The other day, the Lord just reminded me, you know, I am a restorer of the breach. A restorer of that which has been broken. Friends, in the days ahead, people are going to come here and they're going to ask some of you, tell us about what happened. Tell us the stories of how it all happened. And you're going to need to, to need to remember some of these days. Trust me. I don't, you know, it's amazing. John and Carol Arnott go all over the world and they tell people about what happened on the 20th of February, 19, 1994. As they're having an ordinary service, and the Spirit of God fell on that place. 20, what is it, how many years ago? 20 something years ago. 23 years ago. And you know, John's now in his late 70s, and, and everywhere they go, people say, tell us how it happened again. Tell us the stories of what you were doing. Well, we were just doing, they've said it so many times. Well, it was just an ordinary day. But we were hungry for God. And he came. 
And well, the rest is history, really. Amen. And I want to say to you this morning, friends, as I close, don't miss the season we're in. You might think, well, I can't see I want to tell you, listen, God is preparing his house. Yes. This is the word of the Lord. Yes. He's preparing to do abundantly more than you can ask or even imagine. Amen. This morning as I close, I, I want to ask you for a response. You know, really just a response saying, you know, count me in. I'm, I'm in. And I know we've been through a shifting, a, ch a chastening as a church over the last year or so. And God has taken some numbers from us. We've been through a change. We've lost buildings, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the Lord has used us to, use this season to reposition us for the season ahead. And we are about to step into the destiny of heaven. I want to say to you, friends, get ready. Get ready. And I want everyone to remain seated this morning, unless you're saying, you know, Mark, I need to get ready, and I'm going to stand up, I'm going to say, hey, here am I, send me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invite you to stand, if that's you, please don't everyone just stand, because everyone else is standing. I want those to stand this morning, and I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to invite you up, I just want you to stand, close your eyes, reach your hands out, and I'm going to pray for you this morning. Thank you.